Great to see all of you this morning. We're going to pray. We'll get started. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word, a fresh look at it. Looking at how uh, numbers in the Bible emphasize the great themes of the Bible. And as we uh, see the revelation of God through them, that we would be reminded that these themes are not just academically sound, they're, they're words to live by. And take to heart the knowledge that is imparted through them, Father. Bring an anointing to preach, to listen, and to share with others what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Now a little bit of review, and I know some of you haven't been here before, some of you have. We've been looking at the number one and saying foremost that number one is God's number. So far we've given three definite reasons why God's number is number one. Which On your boards, would you write those three reasons down on your whiteboards? Do you remember one of them? If you haven't been in taking class, take a guess at why number one is God's number. You'll probably come up with one of the reasons. And I know that because we have class once a week, uh, seven days is, is a great amount of time to forget things in. So uh, <laughs> give, it a, give it a try, see what you have here. Three reasons why God's number is number one. Walk around and see how we're doing here. It is one of the reasons if you haven't been here, you got it. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes, okay. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm reading up boards here now. Marty hasn't been here, but she says he is all in all the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Yes, that is part of it. He is first, he is the beginning, of course he's the end also. So uh, those are both very good reasons. See, someone else hasn't been here before? He's supreme, absolutely. The creator, the omnipotent, those are good reasons. I may say them a little different, but you're coming up with them. Uh, the Trinity, first and complete. He is first and complete. Uh, he actually is a Trinity. We'll talk about that. I don't know if that's actually what I'm asking for, but it's true. Only God, always been worthy of preeminence. Yes, you don't word them the same way as them, but you got them all there. Very good. Okay. Now, the, the reason I gave you the orders, when I explained it, like I said, you may word them a little different. It's, how will we say it? Uh, he, he is first for three reasons that we, we could say, and we'll look at a fourth today. He was before his creation, so he was first. He is the, oh, we say, the most important of all things in the universe, first. And he has the preeminence, he's the most, yeah, most important, and so he comes first, he is first, he's preeminent or most important, those, those, those are, the, are the reasons we had given so far. Now the fourth one, and Matthew, who wasn't just he couldn't sleep last night, and so he was exhausted and, and wasn't here today, brought up the fourth one, and, and we'll look at it today. The fourth reason here is that God's number one is number one. It has to do with the unity of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now, in the Trinity of the Godhead, there are three divine beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the way, people have stumbled over this. They struggle over this three in one thing. There's one God, but there's three, three uh, how do I say, beings. So, uh, but it is there, and it is in the scriptures that are an absolute oneness in mind and will. Thus, unity or oneness of mind and will is an attribute of God represented by the number one. I was looking at Jesus' prayer in John 17 where he says, he says, Father, Glorify the Son, or he says, glorify me, that I can glorify thee. So, so, it's interesting. Glorify me so that I can glorify thee. The Father wants to give glory to the Son. 
And the Son wants to give glory to the Father. And the Holy Spirit doesn't want any mention of Himself, but He wants to help. And they get along just fine. It's, it's an interesting thing. You know, we talk of uh, uh, altruistic, being other-minded, concerned about others. The three persons or beings in the Trinity are other-minded. The Father always wants to bring glory and honor to the Son. The Son always wants to honor the Father. The Holy Spirit always wants to help. Well, no wonder they get along so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they do, but you can, you can see how it works. And when we become that minded, other minded, we have God's heart for others, a heart for God, and uh, forget about ourselves, we get along real well with one another. They're the most wonderful kind of people to be around. You're fun to do things with those kinds of people. So it's very practical, but it's very spiritual, too. Now, in the scriptures, we're going to look at some, some things in here. First John 10, 30-39. I and my Father are one. The first place we get a hint of this is in the first day of creation, where it says, in the beginning, God created. That word for God is Elohim. It is a masculine plural noun. So we're already told the very first verse in the Bible, the very first time God mentions his name, gives his name, there's a, there's a plurality of beings. Interesting enough, Judaism does not recognize that. They have so the, I've seen different things, scribes try to figure out how this Elohim can be this one God. They have trouble justifying it. Mm. And of course, when, when Jesus is, is a revelation of who the Father is. When God comes in the flesh, we can then see the more than one being. We can see God speak from heaven and, and the Son on earth, and the Holy Spirit helping, and particularly Jesus' baptism. We see all three in operation. But until then, it was a mystery that Judaism had trouble explaining. So, it, you know, it's a progressive revelation, but there it is. Elohim, masculine plural now, there's more than one being in that one God. But he says, I and the Father are one. So, we see it in John 17, 11. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So, Jesus is praying here. This is an interesting time. This is between the cross and him leaving the temple at the final time, final time, he prays this prayer. And in this prayer, he prays that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Now, you have an assignment. Uh, if you have, how many have Bibles with you today? So okay. Look in John 17 and count. How many times does Jesus pray that we would be one? How many times does he pray for oneness in one prayer? And what we're looking at is the principle of, or the law of repetition. That which is most important is repeated over and over again in the scriptures. So let's see how, what it comes out. How many times does it say, you know, that Jesus prayed for oneness amongst believers? Time, but I love you to see these things, not just me to tell you they're there. prayer for oneness amongst us. That we would be one as the Father and the Son are one.
you're watching this on YouTube, I hope you're looking it up to yourself instead of twiddling your thumbs there. <laughs> Look it up, count it, see? Fight them for yourself. someone is being very wise here and checking the concordance on it. Quick way to do it. Not foolproof, but it helps. Right, we're going to give you one more minute to see what you come up with here. show of fingers of how many you found. <laughs> I'm getting different numbers. I see, well, hold them up again. This is fun. I see a six, a three, a three, a three, a, th a four, a nine, and a seven. Oh my goodness, we're going to look at this together now. This, by the way, one of my trick questions is, I go to the Ten Commandments in Exodus, the book of Exodus, I think it's chapter 20. They say, count the Ten Commandments, how many are there? Count them yourself. And I get numbers all over the place. That's another real lesson. It's very interesting. But, uh, well, there's ten of them. It's, it's an interesting count. You, just, you try it sometimes. Be honest, count them. Now, here we go. I showed you the first one. It's in 12. That they may be one. Okay. Now, let's go on here. We've, we've, I've gone through, I've, on my slides, I've got through 14. All right, let's do, go from on from there. Scrolling down. I've, I've highlighted them in red, the ones I found. You've got to read a little bit before he gets back into this again. He mentions his word several times in this verse, and I, I've highlighted it in yellow for this reason. Sanctify them by truth, your word is true. For there to be oneness amongst believers, there have to be people of the word. The more we dig into God's word, the, the more likely there is to be oneness. So, and and uh, also I put in green here, but, oh yeah, now they come up. You see 21 again, that they may be one. That's the second time in verse 21. And he goes into it later in the verse, that they also may be one. Now he's just said it twice in one verse. Mm -hmm. This is his exclamation mark. Then down in 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given uh, to them that they may be one, as we are one. And then one more time in verse 23. I and them, and you and me, that they also may be perfect in one. There's five of them. Now, I know some of you counted in different ways. I don't want to get into a big discussion about it now. That's okay. But I found five of them. And, and of course, the, the law of repetition that he would say five times that they may be one. He's emphasizing unity. Now, why is it so important? I've highlighted it in green here. If you look in verse 21, that they also would be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us. Here's the result. That the world may believe that you sent me. If there is unity amongst believers, there is a promise that the world will believe. Now how does that work? What happens here is when there is unity amongst believers, there, now five is a number for grace. There's five times he prays for oneness. Grace is not added to the believer who lives in unity with other believers. Grace is multiplied. And when grace is multiplied to us, the world sees it. When, this, this is an incredible thing. 
So you, you learn in a local assembly and amongst other believers to, how I say, emphasize the things you have in common because there will always be differences. I know people of all kinds of different doctrinal persuasions, but they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they're on the way to heaven and I call them brother and I remember in what way we are one, not in what way we are different. And uh, there will people, I've never been in a church where since someone, at least subtly, undermining oneness. And what they do, the normal way to undermine oneness and not realize you're doing it, is to become what I call an armchair quarterback. Now, if you're not familiar with football, the armchair quarterback, the guy does not play football. He sits in his chair, watches it on TV, and uh, what's wrong with that quarterback? Can't that guy throw that back? Why didn't he run the ball? Why did coach let that do that? Once you become the critic, you stop becoming a doer of God's work. You either are a doer or a critic. You're, you're a player or an armchair quarterback. You're, you're not both. And when people take on even a subtle criticism, things like, oh, I really love the pastor, but you know, I, I should do this or that. Well, that should be your prayer, not your criticism to another believer. Amen. You're undermining unity. And what you're doing is, if you can get everybody in the congregation to critique the message instead of take it to heart and believe it, there's, there's, there's not a unity, there's not a communication of the word. When people are there, this is the pastor, he's not a perfect man, but God has chosen him, and he will speak to me through his preaching. And I should be listening for God speaking to me, not critiquing the man. Mm -hmm. When we have that attitude towards biblical teaching, towards one another, Grace is multiplied to us. And he, uh, so, two things. In 21, that the world may believe that you sent me. And then again, in 23, remember he repeats it. The law of repetition, that the world may know that you have sent me. He says it twice. If there is unity, there people are going to know it. People are going to see it. It becomes obvious. In our church, one of the things that's been interesting testimony is when someone needs to be moved, and the deacons organize a group of people and we all cheerfully walk on with big smiles and move somebody. It's amazing to watch unbelievers watching this process go on. They're like, oh, you people just like, you're like, you look happy. This is weird. <laughs> and you, you do this cheerfully. You just show up and help people. And I've seen people scratching their head looking at it like, what is going on here? It's called oneness. We take care of each other. It's fun. for family. Oh, yeah. It's just, and, uh, other way I, I've seen it, some of you have been around in the ministry a while, know a guy named Ron Morey, and, and we, I, mean, I, I think Pastor Morey was the first one to preach to him in a bar in Burnt Hills, and this guy had a, he had a semi-automatic weapon, weapon he kept in the back of his car, he'd been through a couple of marriages, and him and his wife show up at church when we were meeting in a, in a farmhouse having a Bible study, and they walk into place, they look at each other and say, God is in this place, says, yeah, I can feel it too. Well, they liked the presence of God so much, they didn't have a place to stay. They, they, we put them up on the farm, and they stayed in a tent, and their, and their son was an infant. We put a crib in my room, and, and they, they liked the presence of God. There was, this was, there was unity amongst this little group of believers, and they sensed the presence of God in it. So you don't want to disturb that unity. And there's a difference between someone, you call them up right away and say, hey, wait, what's going on here? I, I, let's talk about this thing. Humility, even the idea you might be wrong, to keep the bond of unity, it reveals God. It's important. So, he tells us twice, that the world may believe that you sent me, and again, that the world may know that you have sent me. And five times he prays for unity and oneness. All right, so that's the importance of it. Now, uh, I mentioned this, he gave you this answer already. It's incredibly important, law repetition, we talked about that. It takes great, now five times, why? I believe this, it takes great grace to achieve and maintain real unity. It's the grace of God when people do this. I was doing a Bible study this week with some Frenchmen, and I said to them, I said, you know the Bible's written by 40 different men. Do you know, what's the likelihood of you getting 40 Frenchmen to agree on anything? And they burst out in wild laughter. <laughs> And then one of them says, no, no, pastor, 
It's a miracle. Two of them agree on anything. You know, and I, I was, uh, I, I knew what they were, I mean, I knew what I was getting into, but you could say the same thing about Americans. But when there is unity amongst people, it is miraculous. It is unusual. And they can, because they're all receiving from the same Father and, and the same Spirit and the same Word of God. So it takes great grace to achieve and maintain real unity, and great grace is multiplied <coughs> to those who dwell in unity. Amen. You may have a person who's a brother, so you're just, I cannot talk with you anymore. You uh, have a critical spirit, and you're getting in the way of this unity thing. You either need to stop criticizing or not be around me. Mm -hmm. I love you, but I can't hear this anymore. I don't want to hear this anymore. That's, and, and that would be the best thing to do in that situation. You're not angry, you're not mean, but you're, but you're lovingly honest. It's important to, to learn how to do that. So, that the world may believe that you sent me. Two places in the scriptures, we mentioned both of them. And then, another, one third place, a third witness of it, and one of the most people are familiar with, Psalm 133. I'm just going to give you verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This is a wonderful thing to be part of. I enjoy this local church because I love the unity here and the spirit. You just kind of relax. People are kind, they're forgiving, they're patient. They encourage one another. It's a wonderful, it just kind of come here and like you rest in the spirit. I love it. So I want to keep that. Notice in Psalm 133, verse 1 here, this is called the Song of Ascents. It means that when people were traveling on religious pilgrimages to Jerusalem and to go up to the temple, this was the ascent. Jerusalem is on the highest mountain range in a series of ranges where people literally went up. They ascended to Jerusalem. And so they're gathering together and what do they want to experience when they get there? Unity. We come to worship the one God and the, and the temple he gave us. And they worship together and they would sing songs and build each other up and enjoy this unity as they travel together. All right. Now, it is emphasized in Genesis 1-3. I'm using a Young's literal translation, but I've looked at some interlinears and other translations to get it right. On the first day, it says, he called night, and there is evening, and there is morning, day one. That's literally what it says. If you have a King James, or a New King James, or many other translations, it'll say the first day. In Hebrew, there is a difference between saying first and saying one. If you say the Hebrew word first, it simply means in order. It's the first one. If you say the word one, it implies unity. So in the, the day two is not called day two, it's called second, the third day, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, so you go one, but you don't say first. And then after that it's second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh in the days of creation. He's emphasizing God's unity, and I'll show you the definition here. Uh, let's see. You see at the bottom here I'm an interlinear here, this is from, you can all look at this, it's my favorite interlinear, it's free online. Uh, it's Scriptures for All, it's a website, and if you type in Hebrew, English, interlinear, online, it'll come up. So you can actually see a word-for-word -word translation, and it'll say, day one. There it is. Now, I think I have it, now, here's your definition, the word is, for, for one here, ihad. And I've highlighted the part of definition I'm getting at. It has the idea of unity or integrity as when it designates one justice for all, or actual physical unity. It expresses agreement or unity among persons. It's saying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were in absolute agreement. We are going to make this universe. And then man for it. There, there's no disagreement here. They're in complete unity in doing this. So, when we get to, and I have Young's literal translation in uh, day two, it will not say day two, it says day second. Interesting. And commentators 
say this, well, you know, this, the pattern's broken here. Day one, then second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. He switched from cardinal numbers to, uh, to ordinal numbers. Why? And I believe it's because one, uh, part of the meaning of one is oneness and unity. He's, in, he's emphasizing. So, here we have, yeah, day, okay, here's day two, literally. The Hebrew for, not day two, but day what? Second. Day second. And if you do the, if you look through the interlinear, day, day third, day fourth, day fifth, day sixth, day seventh. All right. So, in this, remember we're looking at one, and the first word in the Bible is in the beginning. Now, we do it with three English words, but in Hebrew it's one word. Would you say that Rashid? I don't know. How's your Hebrew there? What do you think? Mike? Oh. Barash. Barash? Barash. Okay, I got put the B, but Barash? Okay, it's close. Anyways, well, uh, a noun, now here's what it means, the first word in the Bible. A noun meaning the beginning, the first, the chief, the best, and the first fruits. It means all those things as it's used in the scriptures. Now that's the first word in the Bible. No. Beginning is first, chief, best, and first fruits. What's the word after it, folks? God. He is all of those things. That's our introduction to God in one word. It's a wonderful way to do it. In a Hebrew Bible, they always take the first three words. So they it would be, you know, in the beginning. That would be how they the first chapter of their Bible. When you get the Septuagint, they call it the Genesis, which means beginning. Okay, I got we're running out of time here. But so here we are. So God is the beginning of all things. He is the first before all created things or of beings. He is the chief or Lord of all. He is the best, and the creation is his first fruit. All in what? One word. To introduce who God is. So you're, this is his preeminence here. He's the beginning of all things, the first before all things, the chief of all things, the best of all things, and his creation is the first fruit of who he is. Isn't that amazing? One word revealing the character of God. And that God is an Elohim, which is a masculine plural noun. More than one being in the Godhead. That much revelation in two words is incredible. Okay, we'll stop there.